Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. Since the very first astronaut program, NASA has placed a significant emphasis on proper training. Nowadays, training modern International Space Station astronauts remains a high priority. The ISS represents a massive collaborative effort between the United States, Russia, Japan, Europe, and Canada. It can support roughly seven crew members at a time inside roughly 15,000 cubic feet of space. Getting to and leaving the space station requires an extensive docking and undocking process. Following the latter, crews need to re-enter Earth's orbit. This is arguably the most dangerous part of the entire process and necessitates strict water survival training efforts. Unlike shuttles, Capsules cannot land under their own power. Therefore, simulating a potential water landing under various conditions has become extremely important. Here, NASA astronauts are taking part in water survival training at Fairchild Air Force Base in Washington. This particular simulation is for a crash landing in rough water. It covers egress procedures, hoist operations, and even raft survival. Throughout the drill, the training crew simulates waves and sea spray using hoses. Meanwhile, lights, smoke, and fans simulate wind and other distractions. A makeshift capsule is also utilized so that the astronauts can practice how to get out of the sinking vessel and make it safely into their life rafts. Teamwork is an obvious necessity in these situations, especially when it comes to recovering the team members. Water actually plays a significant role in other types of astronaut training. After all, being underwater is the best way to simulate weightlessness and a low-cost alternative to expensive centrifuges and zero-g aircraft flights. Here, fully suited astronauts perform spacewalk training. These suits weigh upward of 300 pounds, rendering most astronauts immobile on land. By practicing in water, astronauts can get a real sense of what it's like to walk in space. NASA has massive pools available for these spacewalks. They also commonly include mock-ups of various tools, components, and machinery that the astronauts may be asked to interact with when in space. So, where one individual might be training to perform zero-g external repairs, another can simultaneously practice their movement and navigation abilities in the same pool. Of course, inside the International Space Station, astronauts will have much more freedom of movement. In fact, they will only be asked to don full spacesuits in the event they need to go outside to perform repairs. That said, the ISS is constructed of very small, tight corridors, and it takes very little force to move from one place to another. As such, 
Astronauts need to make sure they know how to move around without damaging any of the sensitive equipment or injuring themselves. For this reason, Johnson Space Center has set up several essential training techniques, including how to operate the scientific equipment and hardware, and how combustion works differently in space than on Earth. All of this training is integral to ensuring the safety and security of everyone on the mission. All of this training culminates in what is still considered the most important part of any space mission the launch. Since the beginning of the space program, billions have been spent optimizing this process while also trying to maximize the safety of everyone concerned. Roughly three hours before launch, the men and women participating in the mission will be suited up and prepped by a team of mission control personnel. Once properly prepared, they will head to the elevator, where they will have a chance to say goodbye to their support teams. The elevator takes them to the surface, where they enter a specially designed Airstream vehicle for transport to the spacecraft. All astronauts need to be cleared by medical personnel before traveling into space. Since they will be in a confined environment, all team members must be healthy and fully capable of dealing with the rigors of the upcoming mission. Here, you can see everything that goes into preparing the actual spacecraft for launch. In this case, that spacecraft is the TESS, which stands for Transitioning Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Known as a planet hunter, it scans the nearby solar system for planets capable of supporting life. The first step in this process is transporting the TESS from Dulles Airport in Washington to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This may seem like a simple process, but it is actually quite treacherous given the sensitive nature of the spacecraft. This is why it is kept in a specialized shipping container, which resists moisture, heat, and cold. The test is then removed from the container and unwrapped by a team of engineers wearing environmental protection suits. The test is then joined with its launch vehicle, the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. The top features a capsule that will protect the sensitive TESS as it shoots through the atmosphere. During encapsulation, the capsule is split and the uncovered TESS is installed inside. The spacecraft will then be moved to the launch vehicle by a special transporter. Once the TESS is placed atop the Falcon 9 rocket, the entire unit is moved from the hangar to the launch pad, where it gets placed into a vertical position. Once everything is in place, the SpaceX and NASA launch teams will perform the final preparations and then initiate the countdown to liftoff.
Astronauts have two methods of returning to Earth once their mission aboard the ISS is complete. The main method uses Russian Soyuz capsules, which have been in service in one way or another since the 1960s. These descent modules are heat shielded to protect the spacecraft and the crew from the high temperatures generated during re-entry. They also have various systems for temperature control, radio communication, and controlling the spacecraft itself. The undocking process is quite difficult, but the more important task is figuring out the specific trajectory and speed needed to safely get the capsule back to Earth. After the crew is in place, the crew commander will unhook himself from the ISS. After the craft is around 20 meters from the space station, they can ignite the engines for several seconds and input descent data into the onboard computer. Since the capsule is still in orbit, it must burn its engines and change its directory into the atmosphere. The atmosphere itself helps decelerate the capsule which will enter the atmosphere upon achieving the optimum directory and begin falling safely down to Earth. The astronauts aren't the only ones responsible for ensuring the capsule and crew enjoy a safe landing. Recovery crews on the ground need to get to the capsule quickly, hook onto it, and move it to a safe location. This job is usually performed by members of the military, such as the group of Air Force personnel seen here. Though capsules can float, spending too much time in water can put the crew and equipment at risk. These men and women are practicing with a Boeing-designed capsule, testing various techniques, lifeboats, and other survival equipment. The Navy has also participated in recovery missions. Specifically, they've tried to see if they can execute launch and recovery operations from the well deck of ships like the USS Arlington. The Orion spacecraft seen here is a partially reusable capsule with glass cockpit displays modeled after the Boeing 787 Dreamliner. It has a mass of around 20,000 pounds, making a recovery difficult, even in calm seas. Fortunately, the combined knowledge, capabilities, and equipment of NASA and the U.S. Air Force and Navy help ensure International Space Station crews get back on land safely, as will their spacecraft. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.